I wanted to go ahead and start this morning with a difficult question, kind of grim, you won't like it, Uh, but it feeds directly into the text. Christian, you have no idea what I'm going to say, but he's like, all right, bring it on. And that's my kind of dude. You're like, bring it on. I don't care. You got a hard question, no sweat. I want you to imagine you got a buddy, a dear friend, somebody that you've been rolling with for a very long time, best friends, you travel together, you laugh together, you cry together, you work together together. A best friend has been for years. I want you to imagine that friend and others get arrested one day and the rulers that did it murder him in front of your very eyes. That would be be tough. Still, moreover, you have another best friend that is arrested and is now waiting on death row and is very likely going to have the same sentence murdered in front of your eyes. Can you imagine it? Can you picture it? What would you do about that? Would you immediately take to the streets, find some some box to stamp on and say, hey guys, there is an innocent man that has just been murdered by our leaders. Would you take to the streets? Maybe we're on social media and we're punching that out, putting it on blast to everyone who can possibly listen so that we can right this injustice. Maybe you'd start a GoFundMe, a legal campaign. You hire good lawyers, and you try to liberate your friend who is wrongly accused, wrongly imprisoned, and maybe you can save his life. Maybe some of you still have more active roles. Some of you guys, you, you alphas in the room, you're like, bro, I can call some of my buddies, and we can, we can put some force on. We, we, let's go liberate this dude from prison. Maybe that's you but you want action. You want to do something about it, right? How many of you instead would say, like, no, 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 I'm going to send thoughts and prayers? (laughs) Why'd you laugh? Thoughts and prayers. Well, you can laugh at thoughts. What do thoughts do? Sending you my thoughts. So new agey, your thoughts aren't going to do jack. They would do zero things for them. It's nice. It's a good sentiment. But what about prayers? I've had so many of these active killer events happen, and they come down my newsfeed over the years. And you feel so helpless. You feel so enraged by it. But you sit back and you say, hey, man, I'm sending out prayers. Maybe you'll get in the comment section and be like, hey, praying for you. And still others will be like, pray for you. Let's do something about this, right? Maybe prayer is doing something about it. Because this scenario that I just put to you, this difficult question, is exactly what we're dealing with in the the book of Acts chapter 12. So let's go to the text. Some of y'all are already realizing, like, man, Pastor John is not playing around this morning. I'm not. I'm not. Here we go. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was being kept in prison. But earnest prayer for him was being made to God by the church. Now, just a little bit of context. The Christians throughout the book of Acts, the very start of the church, the Christians are bullied, intimidated, mocked, jeered, bullied, beaten, arrested, and murdered now. When they can't intimidate you, make you self-censor, to be silent, stop speaking about Jesus. Stop saying that offensive thing you call the truth. When they can't make you shut up, when they can't censor you, the next thing comes physical force, arrests. We've got people in this room that have been arrested for the cause of Christ already. Uh, There's beatings. There's murders. And that's what happens. It is a scaling up of persecution, and that's exactly what we're seeing uh, here. When they couldn't intimidate, they went uh, violent. Beatings, prison, insults, angry mobs, murder. Now, 
what I want to cue in on today is their response, which isn't at all like our visceral in the flesh response. We want action. I want to do something about it, right? Don't just sit around thinking about it. Don't just sit around and pray about it. Let's do something about it. But what ended up happening is a prayer earnestly on their knees, hands lifted high, asking the God maker of heaven and earth to act and do something, unleashed the power of God. And what ended up happening was yet another miraculous prison break. Do you know why Peter was under four squads of soldiers? It's because earlier when they arrested him, they had him under lock and guard. God did an angelic prison break, and nobody could figure out how Peter got out of prison. But the Roman government had surmised that Peter, the magician, is an escape artist, and he can just get out. So he's like, quadruple the guards, don't let any of them out. By the way, if you do lose the guy you're guarded from, what's the penalty for that? You get put to death. God ends up orchestrating yet another miraculous prison break, and Peter finds himself outside the prison walls. Now, the rest of the text, as it goes down to verse 19, is actually a really kind of funny Shakespearean comedy of errors where he's out and he tries to get in with all the other disciples and they don't believe he's there. Anyway, it's a fun text. Go ahead and read through it, but I don't want to go there right now. I'll just let you know he gets out. It's really amazing. But the thing that looses him isn't any of the action and, and action of us. It was the prayers of the church. Today, we're going to be talking about prayer. Uh, what we see here is earnest prayer by the church, which unleashed the power of God to actually do something. What I want to build uh, for us now is a lot of us will think, okay, there's acting and then there's prayer. I'm like, no, 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 no. The best action is the prayer. What many of us will treat as a very last resort, we've done everything we can, all we can do is pray now. Oh, has it come to that? That's all you can do is just pray for it? Like, no, no, no. Is it your last resort or is it our first result? Do you think that that's, that's our last hope or our best hope? No, no, no. Prayer is the action. And holy smokes, guys, if we understood what prayer could unleash in our own lives, in our relationships, in our church, we would let that be the thing that powered every single day of our lives. We're going to lean into that, and this is going to be an incredible practical sermon where we're going to talk all about the what's, the how's, the where's, the why's of prayer and still more earnest prayer. Now, if I asked you, if I put you on the spot, and I'm not going to make you do it because I'm not into total like public humiliation and shaming this morning, maybe next week, but right now I'm feeling good because we're doing the baptism thing. Yeah, baby. How many of you, if I put you on the spot, I'm like, how's your prayer life? You doing well? You praying like you should? How many of you would immediately be like, ah, oh, well, you know, I'm kind of hit and miss there. When things are going bad, maybe I pray some, but uh, perhaps you don't really have the prayer life you know that you should. And I say, why is that? Is it that you don't really think that prayer changes things? You don't really think prayer works. Now, we just saw in Acts chapter 12, prayer was working. Prayer did something that was absolutely impossible. Jesus tells us that when we pray, we shouldn't pray like somebody doubting, right? If you doubt and you don't have faith, yeah, of course your prayer isn't going to work. You don't even think God can do it, so God won't do it. Of course there's not going to be power attached to your prayers. Of course you'll come to the conclusion that prayer doesn't work because you're praying and you don't even believe. That faithlessness does not unleash the power of God. So one, we identify, why aren't you praying? Is it secretly you don't think God is powerful and strong to act? Maybe you think he does, but he wouldn't do it for you. Maybe you are just distracted. Maybe, you know, no, 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 you believe in prayer. You just had a lot to do. 
holy cow, I mean, you're juggling different work and responsibilities. And hey, John, if you knew all this stuff I deal with, you would understand why I'm not prayerful. Maybe you're just so busy that you can't get to it. Well, what's the old expression? If, this, if Satan can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Anybody ever heard that? A br- yeah, br- is it Corey Tinboom? What a gal. Absolute hero, Corey Tinboom. I've referenced her in a sermon in the existence of Grace City Church. She's only like six, seven months old now, guys. But we're doing it, baby, huh? Give ourselves a round of applause. <laughs> awesome. The Lord is good. He's doing great stuff here. Thank you, thank you. Maybe we're distracted by work. Maybe we're distracted by entertainment. Many of us, the biggest enemy of our prayer life is our what? It's our phone. How many of you just scrolling your life away? Scroll, scroll. Or you're binge watching shows or you're hooked into video games trying to get the skeleton sword, all the berries, and you save the universe from intergalactic destruction. And once you do that, then I'm going to talk to God. It'll be amazing. Maybe we're just set, we've distracted ourselves away from prayer and from God. I'm convinced that if some of us spent the same amount of time in prayer as we do with our phones, you would be unleashed as such a holy person, chariots from heaven would sweep down and take you away without death like Elijah. That's what would happen if we, weren't, if we took the phone time and just went into prayer time. Like you're walking on water, baby. Holy smokes. We spend so much time distracted. And it's not that the phone is necessarily always a bad thing. It's what it's taking us from. I think Satan will do anything he can to work you, distract you, or entertain you away from the power that could be unleashed through communion and God through prayer. Amen? We're just getting started, guys. And some of you are, you're kind of like, all right, it's game time. Let's make some changes. I think we will, guys. I think we're going in a great direction, and uh, you're going to be helped by this. I was certainly helped by this, and our church is going to grow. Maybe you feel unworthy. Maybe that's why you're not praying. Maybe you, you, you feel like God is mad at you, or you're not good enough to approach him, right? This is also, well, perhaps uh, true, but God who loves us loves us not because we're good enough, but because he's good. Not because we're lovable, but because he's loving. And so in our depravity, in our filth, in our shame, in our weakness, the God who loves us stoops down and speaks tenderly to us, loves us, wants us to speak out for forgiveness, for strength, for wisdom, for communion. No one's good enough to get God right? But you don't have to be. He comes not because we're worthy, but to make us worthy, right? And so we can't let that stand in our way. Maybe you don't really pray because you just don't know how. You don't know how. And so it's to that I want to really lean in. What is prayer anyway? I'll say this. Prayer is communicating with God. That's it. In whatever form, if you're communicating with God, that is prayer. God wants to communicate with us. God made us in the first place. And then he made communication. The author of people and the author of communication does in fact want to speak to us. This is exactly what the Bible tells us. I quoted this recently in a sermon, 1 Thessalonians 5, where it says, be joyful always, pray without ceasing. And in all things, give thanks to God. God wants us to pray all the time. God's communicating to us. He wants us to communicate back. We need it. We're told to do it. And uh, yeah, let's go to Colossians 4, verses 2 through 4, to underscore this point again. Devote yourselves to prayer. There's an interesting word. Devote. What what does it mean to devote yourself to something? I mean, that's like a whole body mind, soul, strength kind of thing, to devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, this is Paul, uh, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. May that I proclaim it clearly as I should. And so I see 
Paul admonishing us of like, hey, pray all the time. Just like we are praying all the time for you. And then pray for us that we are able to have great effectual ministry and pray that the message of the gospel is proclaimed clearly from us as well. Prayer, prayer, prayer. I see it happening all the time. Now, it still remains of like, well, what does that look like? How does it work? Jesus answers this in Matthew chapter 6. And though I don't have it up on the screen, I'm just going to skip around. In Matthew 6, he starts off by saying what we shouldn't pray like. It's the hypocrites. It's the religious people that make these long prayers on street corners. And they're trying to be hyper spiritual. They want to impress you with how lordly and amazing that their prayers are. And God, knowing their hearts, knows it's a bunch of empty words. It is very possible, Jesus is leading us to understand, that you could have a bunch of holy-sounding words, but your heart is far from God. Don't pray to impress people. Don't pray to impress yourself. Actually try to have a real, authentic, truthful conversation with God. He knows whether you're lying or not. Pray to God in secret in this case. Not like the Pharisees, but in secret. Now, there's times for praying publicly, times for praying together, times for praying in secret. But uh, in this text, he's talking about a special type of prayer where we're stealing away and uh, and praying in secret. And then he gives us kind of a guide, a script, if you will. And he says, hey, pray this prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He gives us the Lord's Prayer. I want to go through it real quick. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. So we're starting off recognizing, hey, God, you're in in heaven. I'm on earth. You're not like me. I'm not like you. You are holy and good and perfect. So we start off with an admitting of who God is and how he is amazing. I'm starting off this prayer in praise. And what I want you to do by this is one, in, in praying, we can have like a scripted guided prayer like this. This is the Lord's prayer. And you can just say it as rote memorization right? You can have a scripted thing, but I think this prayer is meant to be more of a guide for us so that we're not just rattling off a bunch of words that we've said so many times. We have no idea what's going on. So what I do when I say the Lord's Prayer, I like to change the words just a little bit to make the meaning fresh, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm using it as a scripted guide. This is one way we can pray, using a scripted guide. Your kingdom come, your will be done. God, you got a mission I pray that you would bring that mission here to the earth and you would let me be a part of it on earth as it is in heaven. God's ruling supreme in heaven. Right now the earth is fallen. We want God to rule earth the way he rules heaven. So Father, come and have your way on earth. Let me help. Give us this day our daily bread. Whatever your needs, whatever your deep desires of, whatever you need to happen, God, please give us the things that you know that we need. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I have sinned against you, God. Please forgive me for my sins. And for all the people that I've sinned against, I pray forgiveness for that. And people who have sinned against me, I pray for forgiveness for them as well. Forgiveness all around. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus is literally telling us how to pray. And this is a scripted guide directly from Jesus himself on how we pray. Now, you could use a scripted guide, but another way that we could pray is something more conversational. This is off the cuff. This is if I pulled a seat on stage and it was just me alone up here and I had a seat here and just like I would speak to my father or a close friend, uh, how I would just speak to God my fears, my anxieties, my thoughts, my questions. And I don't have any holy roller language as if I'm going to impress God. It's not like I add some these and thou's, thouest mine God, if thy shall show in out of your bounty to bless. It's not like God only speaks in 13th century Gaelic English, you know? If I just speak naturally off the cup, authentically to God, This is a wonderful way that we can pray, scripted, uh, guided, uh, scripted or conversational. Prayers can be out loud or silent. Most of my prayers are silent. 
It almost happens on autopilot now where I'm praying and I don't realize I have begun praying. It's just something that's like a backup program ro rolling. You know, and then other times, and, and it kind of fades in and out without me really thinking much about it. It's just like an inner voice of prayer that is going because it's always going. It's, it's almost like an internal habit of mine now, right? And what I want to do in the future is grow that way more. Because right now as it stands, my brain will just get kind of distracted. What is that cartoon movie? Uh, I think uh, it's Up, where you got the dogs, and they're focusing and talking about something, and then all of a sudden, there's like a squirrel, and they're like, squirrel! A lot of us, that's how we pray. Father, you are good, and you are wonderful, and did I answer that text message? I'm going to go do that real quick. And we're just so distracted, it's hard to make any progress in our prayers. And so, sometimes when that's happening for me, and I'm praying silently, I switch to out loud. When I'm speaking out loud, it kind of keeps the motor on track and running. And so speaking out loud, even while you're by yourself, speak your prayers out loud if you're having trouble with your mind wandering. If you find yourself falling asleep or nodding off, stand up, walk around, and speak out loud. And this is a great way that you can keep your mind on track. So we can have scripted prayer, conversational prayer. They can be out loud. They can be silent. They can be short prayers. They can be long prayers. There's been times in my old profession where I was sure I was about to die. And my prayer went something like this. Oh, God, help me. Whoom! And then we're moving through rooms, clearing Hunt Terrace. <laughs> that was my prayer. It was that short. Oh, God, help me! <laughs> short prayers. And then there's long prayers. Prayers that will go on for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, two hours. Praying. Uh, they can be powerful prayers or they can be weak prayers. Now, always we want our prayers powerful, but I wanted to pause right here and just say, just because you're praying doesn't mean stuff is happening. Prayer is predicated on a few things. Let's go to the book of James real quick. We'll check out James chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So this is really cool. The holier we get, the more like Jesus we become, the more we've confessed our sins so that there's not some secret barrier between us and fellow man or us and God. We have been asked forgiveness. We're trying to live according to God. We've got our ducks in a row. We're kind of marching along that Christian life. I'm living for Jesus. Your prayer becomes increasingly more and more powerful. God's listening to you. And we notice your Christian life isn't meant to be alone, is it? This is part of why we have our city groups. Here we are the church gathered. During the week we're the church scattered. And so you guys who are starting to the very first time meeting in these city groups, these communities that live missionally together, you're able to confess sins together. You're able to pray for each other. You're able to encourage each other just as like the church is supposed to do. Isn't that cool? We all belong to each other. There's no private faith the Lord has not called you to grow closer to him in isolation. That is not the Christian life. You are meant to be part of a community, one body with many parts belonging to each other, sharing to each other, and your spiritual walk is contingent upon you being in church fellowship with others. That's the plan for your spiritual growth is through good relationships in the context of the church. That's what we're meant to be on, right? Very good. Just as Jesus will marry the church in heaven, we're betrothed to him as the church. Pretty cool. All right, very good. Um, we can also have passionate or more kind of common prayers. Common prayer, that, that's usually the kind I'm doing. It, it, it's, it's more of a casual prayer. I'm praying about something, but I'm not like sweating on my knees, intercessing. This is the kind of prayer that the church was doing. There was a heart burden. How many of you, uh, how many of you can think of an issue you're dealing with right now that's heavy? You got somebody that may be about to die. Somebody who's fighting for their lives in the ICU. Somebody whose marriage is falling down. To pieces. Somebody who has lost their job and they have no idea how they're going to support their family. 
It's in these times where we are in desperate need for God to break through and release power in our lives or wisdom. We need a miracle. This is when we move into earnest prayer. So there's prayer, and then there's earnest prayer. That's passionate prayer. That means hands lifted up. That means fingers laced tightly together. That means on our knees, our heads on the ground, us crying out. Maybe quite literally weeping. Maybe we're asking other people to participate with us to come in and be like, hey, I need prayer right now. You're activating prayer chains so that other people can pray with us as well. This is what unleashed the power of God to rescue Peter from certain death and imprisonment. It was the passionate pleas of his people. It was that kind of earnest prayer that released the miraculous. Earnest prayer. Now, we know what that looks like here. Uh, it looks like how Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, for instance. We have reference to this in Hebrews chapter 5. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. This is a, a, this is a guide for us. Jesus loving us, weeping for us, loud cries for us. Earnest prayer. How many of you are encouraged to know that Jesus loves you? He wants relationship with you. And this is the kind of prayers he prays for us, that we might repent of our sins and turn to the God who loves us and died for us with loud cries and supplications, with tears, Jesus opens up nail-scarred hands and invites you to love him back forever. Jesus praying for us. That's earnest prayer. We pray earnestly oftentimes when we have great need. Somebody's sick, somebody's dying. Maybe we need wisdom. Colossians 1 verses 9 through 10 tells us uh, that Paul had not stopped praying for them. He says, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him, please him in every single uh, way. I know earnest prayer is broken out when you have uh, intense pain, when you have intense need, when you desperately need direction, this is what earnest prayer stems from. Now, we have common prayer. We have earnest, passionate prayer. Both are important. I'm not asking you to always pray earnestly. Who could keep up with that? You know, of like, I've got all kinds of stuff. Of like, what you don't want to do, holy roller, is you all are about to have a chicken pot pie for dinner, and you're like sweating droplets of blood over the food, and at some point you just got to eat, you know? So it's not everything's an earnest, passionate prayer. But let me tell you, as we are passionately praying at some point, what earnest prayer is not. It's not surface level. When we don't really know how to pray, uh, this can come across. I know years ago, my sons, as they're on their way to manhood, years ago, my boys were learning how to pray. They were really into animals, though. And so all they could really think to pray for is all the animals in the whole world. We also had a bullfrog that lived in our drain pipe behind our house. What was his name? Ribbit. 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 And so our prayers by our little boys at the time was like, God bless everyone and everything, including Ribbit and all the animals. And my boy, no, no bullfrog has ever received as much <laughs> intercessory prayer as Ribbit, who lived in our train pipe. I don't know where he is. He's probably taken up to heaven. He didn't die a natural death. Uh, he was taken away by powerful prayers of my kids. So Ribbit and all the animals got prayer uh, prayed for. And now we listen, Becca, we listen to our kids pray. And uh, sometimes when they're praying and we hear their hearts growing in love for the Lord and they're learning uh, through wisdom of Bible how to pray, we're listening to them pray sometimes, and we kind of crack eyes at each other, kind of like, hey, 
good job, mom. And she looks back at me of like, good job, dad. I'm like, we're raising them in the Lord. They're growing in their ability to pray. Their prayers are becoming more attuned and passionate. They're loving and more selfless. They are growing in prayer. And so when we start off, though we may want to pray, we're not really sure how, and we have surface prayer. Passionate prayer, earnest prayer, it's also, it's not surface level, and it's not compulsory, and it's not obligatory. It's not, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies, and us to your service, and there thy bounty we receive, amen. How many of you have like scripted prayers, and you just kind of run through it, you're just checking the block, you know? I've already talked about scripted prayers, and you can have that as kind of a guide, but maybe when you bow your head before you eat, Praying before you eat, it's just a good time to rally everyone together and like, hey, let's pray together. But if your prayer is like this canned thing without thought, without any heart, you're not intercessing for anyone else, you're not, it's not a, there's nothing fresh in there. There's nothing authentic. There's none of you. It's just, we, your servants, ask you to bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies and us to your service so that we might, that's it. It's like a canned thing. Don't you know the Lord is not impressed with that? Don't you know there's no power that's ever going to be unlocked in your life if you've got this canned speech that you think is going to placate God? This is getting you nowhere, right? The same thing. And I wonder, you know, if you're bored with your prayers, God's probably bored with your prayers also. Well, you stop just saying meaningless words and say something, anything, as long as it's honest to the Lord. It can be a short prayer. Be a long prayer. It can be anywhere in between. But uh, we as a family like to sit down and say something to the Lord that's fresh, something that's thinking of someone else. We're not casually just whispering a quick prayer to get it over with so we can get to what's really important, the mashed potatoes, right? Now, <laughs> if it, who's being helped today? Good? Awesome, awesome. You guys are amazing. Why should we pray, guys? Why do you pray? I, I rattled off a quick list for you. Uh, one thing we pray, uh, one reason why we pray is when we want something. Even people who are atheists, you know, once they've tried everything, they really want something, maybe they'll just secret, they'll never confess to it, but they're going to pray to the cosmos, to whatever, and I'm like, oh God, if you're there, really help me get this car, this job, this girl, whatever. Uh, you know how to pray for what you want? You pray for what you want. We also pray when we are fearful. I've personally seen this with people who never read Bible. They don't care about God or anything else like that. You get a man scared enough, and he will pray. There's an old expression that there's no atheists in foxholes. Anybody heard that? And that means when you fear for your life, all of a sudden rounds are incoming, and you think that you're about to die, everyone gets very, very spiritual. I've seen it on the battlefield. When you think you're going to die, when you're afraid, is one reason uh, why we pray. Another reason why we pray is when we're in intense pain. Give me something, I'm scared, rescue me, and ouch, please make the pain stop. This is oftentimes why people pray. But I want to bring to our attention one of the biggest reasons why we pray, it isn't to get something from God or to get bailed out of trouble. Really, the biggest reason why we pray is communion with God. One of the major reasons we should be praying, why you should want to, why you're going to start more and more, is this is what brings us closer to God. We want to be with God so that we can be like God. If you're not spending time with God, there is no chance you're going to be like him. Some of us have been just going through life as a Christian, and if you're honest, you haven't grown in years. Why is that? It's probably because you're not prayerfully spending time with the Lord. I'll give you a secret. You're never going to grow without prayer. It is the powerhouse. It is the secret. It's Bible and praying by the Holy Spirit. Those two things together equals always a transformed, radically, radical, power-filled life that is going to change you and everyone else. Some people may think that prayer doesn't really change things, and that is a lie. Absolutely, prayer changes things. But the biggest reason we pray 
communion with God, is it to make things change? It's actually to change us. We grow spiritually. And so the Lord taking advantage of us in our weakness, of us in our fear, of us in our pain, it's actually a wonderful, merciful gift from God because we contend with Him, we struggle with Him, and in so doing, grow closer. How many of you have watched the Ultimate Fighting Championship? Some of you can imagine how this segue is going to work, but come on. I'm your pastor. I haven't steered you wrong so far. In UFC, you can sometimes have a grudge match. These two dudes hate each other. And then they get in a a ring. They beat each other to a bloody pulp. And what do they do at the end? They hug it out. And you girls are like, I don't get it. And every dude's like, I get it. (laughs) I'm not crying. Had something with a lot of onions. No, we get it immediately. You know, like that struggle actually brings you closer together. That pain, that fear, it brings you closer together. I was thinking in preparation for this message about Jacob. Jacob was said to be visited by the angel of the Lord. We think that's the second member of the Trinity. Jesus himself came and wrestled with him. A wrestling match all night long. And Jacob, who would be renamed Israel and be a father of the, uh, of, of the nation of Israel, was saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so the Lord touched his hip, dislocated it, and he limped for life. That's a pretty cool move. You know, I'm trying to work out that, what, that, that's an awesome move. Jesus, undefeated at wrestling. Fantastic. Way to go. What this is, it's a picture of prayer. It's a picture of prayer. It's wrestling with the Lord. Jacob thought he was about to die. He was wrestling with the Lord. In, in, and so this, a picture of prayer, this wrestling, this striving creates a dependency on God. And that is the blessing. The blessing is the dependency. It's the struggle. It's the striving. It's that communion with God. The nearness we get in the midst of our darkest moment. The Lord is there. And where we think the point of prayer is to deliver us through it, we don't realize, no, 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 the point of the pain is to deliver us to God. Isn't that cool? He's brilliant. We're down here, idiot people, and he's up there playing 4D chess. Amazing, spectacular, manifold wisdom uh, of God. We also pray to God for forgiveness. If you are not a Christian, this is your first prayer. If you ever want any power in prayer, it all starts with this. The Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You don't get faith unless you put, uh, unless you are converted, and you can't convert without forgiveness. God, I am sorry I've offended you. I've lived my own life. Please forgive me for my sins. Change me from the inside out. Give me your heart. Fill me up. Take my life. Use me however you want. Save my soul, Lord. And that's the first step. Your first prayer that works is the prayer of forgiveness. If you haven't prayed for forgiveness, you should do it. You should do it. Uh, we We can also pray for gratitude. He says, Pray without ceasing. In all things, give thanks. We don't just run to the Lord of like, gimme, 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 gimme. It's no, you've already given so much. I I can tell the maturity of someone by their prayers. How much are you asking for new stuff and how much are you just in gratitude thanking you for what you already have? It's the grateful heart that recognizes how much God has already given you. It's the ungrateful one that's always asking for something and not remembering what the Lord has already been so good to give. We should ask for things, but we should also be grateful in what God has already done. We've got needs. They're legitimate needs. Some of you have real true needs. You should get your city groups around you, and you should pray about those needs earnestly if it's a dire need and watch the power of God answer that need. Write it down in a journal, and what you can do is track the amazing blessings the Lord does. Becca and I have seen the Lord come through for us over and over and over again in these impossible, wonderful things. Just remember, so broke, couldn't couldn't pay, (laughs) had no idea, and then somebody drops off the exact amount we need to survive for another month. 
It's like, whoa, the, do- the dollar amount match. I'm like, wow, that's so cool. Over and over, we've experienced the blessing of the Lord uh, at the exact right time. And uh, we love them. Uh, we love them for it. Healing, we pray for protection. Uh, this is physical protection. This is also protection against the enemy. There is a true demonic realm that despises you, hates you, and has this amazingly orchestrated plan to take you out of the fight, to destroy you and to destroy your influence and impact uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life and those around you. There is a plan to take you out. And so we pray for protection. Deliver us not into evil. Keep us from the enemy, right? And so we recognize greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. It's not even a fair match, but between you and Satan, you are outgunned. You will lose every time compared to Jesus and Satan. He can't touch him, right? And so we pray for protection. We also pray for wisdom. We pray for strength. We pray for spiritual growth. The all reasons why we should pray. What I'm doing is I'm trying to uh, put out this juicy meal, a buffet in front of you and be like, look at all this stuff you could be tapping into. It's yours for the asking. And we ask with a heart full of faith, recognizing the God who is there, who loves you and wants to give his kids good presents, right? We just had Christmas a month ago. And how many of you parents just love giving your kids good presents? You see them just freak out. And they're like, ah! And we're doing the same thing. We're like, yeah! Woo! We got it! Loves giving good gifts. Our God is a father who loves giving good gifts. And look what's under the Christmas tree, guys. Everything you could ever think uh, of, of wanting. There it is. Fantastic. Um. Real quick, because I'm running out of time here. Y'all talk too long, I think. Uh, how, how can we up our prayer game? How many of you want uh, already, I mean, you're chomping at the bit. You're like, man, I'm going to attack this. I'm going to unleash a new level of spiritual growth in my life. I'm ready for that. Give me some practical advice, John. And I'm so glad that you asked that, because I'm going to do exactly that. Uh, one thing, uh, prayer walks. My wife is a prayer walker. She likes to get alone in the woods uh, with her worthless little dog. And uh, <laughs> I'm still of the Ron Swanson opinion. Any, any dog under 50 pounds is a cat. <laughs> yes. She, she's a prayer walker. And so she'll go walk our woods around our property. And she just spends time with the Lord. I also like prayer walking. It's a fantastic way where we can escape all of our technology and be alone with the Lord. This is what Jesus did all the time. He's doing ministry, and then he was often, oftentimes, all the time, disappearing, going off to a a silent, peaceful place where he could just be alone with the Father. That's what he was doing. He's going up on the mountaintops and spending time with the Lord in prayer. Some of us, what we need to do, the great spiritual breakthrough in your life is just walking out your front door and doing a few laps around the neighborhood and you're just speaking to the Lord under your breath. Prayer walks are cool. You can also drop a few LBs over the time. It'll be great. Double win. Spiritually stronger, physically stronger. You're welcome. Uh, Another thing we can do to up our uh, prayer game is we ask the Holy Spirit to help. The Holy Spirit is there to energize our prayers, to guide our hearts into what we should be praying for, to give us the motivation to pray in the first place. That's part of the thing is you just don't want to pray. Well, God, I just don't want to pray. And I am sorry for that. I'm sorry for the distractions. Holy Spirit, please come screaming into my heart and give me the desire to seek you. Give me the desire to pray, even now. What I'm doing right now is I'm praying about praying, and it works. It's fantastic. 
And so the Holy Spirit can help us in our weakness, in our frailty, in our sin, in our flesh, in our distraction, entertainment, loving, idolatrous selves. He can stoop, see us where we're at in that moment, and create in us a clean heart that desires communion with the Father. Is that great? Ask the Holy Spirit for help all the time about everything. It'll be wonderful. It's good because you're pathetically weak and he's super strong right? That's great. I'm really strong though. (laughs) I said it all like awful. I'm totally in the same boat. The closer I get to the Lord, the more I realize my unadulterated dependency on him. I just need the Lord for everything, my daily bread. And in my strength, truly, I just can do nothing. Nothing good, nothing lasting, nothing eternal. Nothing according to his purposes, which is what we were one on board. Uh, And so we pray that the Holy Spirit will help us, us in our weakness to be able to please God. Uh, Another way to up your prayer game is to go off script. Just talk to God naturally, organically, authentically. Don't think that these and thous are going to help you. It's not a special language or a special holy walk that's going to lead you down the path of righteousness. Be honest and open before the Lord, and that is going to uh, rejuvenate and strengthen your prayers. Uh, Pray with other people as well. Hey, man, let's pray together. You know, this is something we do all the time. Uh, Pastor Chris and I, we're in the green room back here before service, as is our custom, and we pray together, right? That's what's unlocked. Like, never would I consider coming up and preaching before you here without someone praying for me. And I'm praying for me. And you should be praying for me as your pastor. I need your prayers. And the, the, um, the more filled with the Holy Spirit and the more prayers I get, the more benefit you get. It is good for you to pray for your leaders. And hey, you owe me. I pray for you all the time. You owe me this. Is that funny? We, we put these online and some guy, I mean, it's amazing. Trolls just have no sense of humor. They're just complete literalist. You'd be like, um, uh, excuse me, I don't think that, and they're just going to tear me up. It's a joke, bro. It's a joke. Holy cow, man. Take a knee, drink some water, face out, pull security. Think about it a moment. It's just a joke. These holy rollers in the comments. Uh, Here's another way, and I don't really like this one much, but I have to say it because it works. I've done it a lot. I will continue to do it in the future, and that's schedule time with the Lord. I don't like this in my flesh because it feels like, well, it's forced. You shouldn't have to schedule time. But I think that it is absolutely great, especially when you've got a packed life and all kinds of competing priorities. I love my wife, and because of that, and I carry so much responsibility if I don't set times where we can connect, if I, and I don't protect that time, all that time will get eaten up and, and, and filled up by something else, right? And so our kids have a certain time where they go down to bed. Now, they don't go straight to bed. They, they ask us, hey, Daddy, can we read and how long? And we'll give them like, all right, you can read for 45 minutes, then you can talk for 15, and then your light's out by 9.30. And they're like, okay, Daddy, thanks. And then they disappear. But the big thing is, is, Kid time is done. We have kept you alive today. You're welcome. We have met all your needs. We have loved you, and we're crushing it. But now it's mommy, daddy time. Get out of here. Don't come back down. This is our time now, and now I'm going to spend time with my wife. And so part of I'm scheduling their time in hours of like there's there's a definitive break. Nope. Kid time is over. Goodbye. Now it's husband, wife time. And we're going to invest in our relationship. We do the same thing with dates. Dates are amazing. Um, And uh, it is a time where you're scheduling with your wife because you love her. Similarly, let's schedule time with the Lord because we love him. In the morning, at night, in the middle of the day, prayer time. Right? Um, I'll I'll do this. I know this isn't under... uh, this isn't under the schedule time. It's actually under the prayer walk time. But sometimes I, I, I just feel just like harried in my spirit. Uh, I'm at work and I'll walk out of my office. No explanation to employees. I'm just like, see ya. And I walk out and I'll do 
a, a lap or lap or few around uh, my office park. And it's just a way I'm spending time with the Lord. Uh, and I'm decompressing. And when I come back, usually even just in a little 10, 15 minute time where I'm spending time connecting with the Lord, I'm disconnecting of the problems. I'm like, I don't know how to solve this. I'm getting stressed. I feel stuck. And I just kind of do an internal audit and be like, I think I need time with the Lord. And so when I go to him, I'm oftentimes not even trying to be like, Lord, help me with X, Y, Z problem. I'm like, no, 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 that problem will be here in 15 minutes. I'm just going to spend time with the Lord, meditating, being still, being silent, and I'm just prayer walking uh, before. And oftentimes it's that rejuvenation uh, that will help me. But uh, I realize I'm not doing the prayer walk to get the solutions to the problem. That would be an error. Instead, I'm recognizing in my spirit my Jesus meter has gotten too low, and I need more God. I need more Holy Spirit in my life. I'm trying to pour out, and there's nothing left. I need to be recharged, and that's what the power is, right? You don't get God to get the stuff you want, right? We just go toward God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, And then all the other stuff you care about a lot, that all comes as well. He throws it in. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be given to you as well. And he shows that heart direction. Like, no, no, no. You think you're after the stuff. The job, the girl, the raise, the money, the car, the 401k, the blah, blah, blah. You think it's about that. But really, everything, it's really all just about communion with God and jumping on his mission. That's it. That's it. And if we could just in a moment see past the urgency of this lost, fallen world, we would recognize that Jesus' mission is all. My job, it isn't an extension of my identity. It's a funding mechanism for this church. That's what we're doing. It's super fun. Mission. Jesus' mission is all there is. Uh, Schedule time with the Lord. Another thing you can do is journal. I'm not going to do this one. I've done it. Becca loves doing this one. How many of you are journalers? Journaling is a fantastic way to kind of order your thoughts. You can write out prayers if you want, or you can type them. What I would do oftentimes is I'd take my laptop, I would tilt the screen down like this so I couldn't see, and then I would just freeform type out my prayer, every thought. And my uh, thing was, is ne- don't hit backspace. The Lord is going to see through your autocorrections. Don't hit backspace and don't let your fingers stop moving. So you keep your mind going. And that was probably my favorite way that I ever came to journal. And and it's just like my prayer brainstorm. And it's faster than writing. Another way that you can do it is you just write like a word down or a, a, a a, a few words. And then you pray about that. And then there's the next thing. And still, you can have a journal, like a list of things that you're going to pray for. And I'll separate mine according to category of like, all right, I'm going to pray for Grace City, Rome. And I'm going to pray for our leaders. I'm going to pray for guests that are going to come. I'm going to come for salvations. I'm going to pray for these few needs. And so this is the category of Grace City, Rome, where we're at. Then I'm going to pray for family, not in order, but I'm going to pray for my family. I'm going to pray for protection of my sons. I'm going to pray for my wife and uh, all the things that I know she's struggling with and I have gratitude for. I'm going to pray for people that I've uh, got broken relationships with that I want to see through. I'm going to pray for needs that I have in my life that I want met. I'm going to pray for just things that I want. I'm going to pray for time with the Lord. I'm going to pray about everything I can think of, but I've got it categorically kind of done out. And I'll do that more than like a long-form journal. It's kind of more like a list. The list guides the prayers. You understand? Uh, And another thing how to up your prayer game is speak out loud. Speak out loud so that your mind stays on uh, track. Fantastic. We're, uh, it's 2.10. We are out of time. Uh, so I'm going to close, and then we're going to dunk some people. Sound fun? Yeah. Baptisms, baby. <laughs> Woo! Fantastic. Here, here's my close. One of my great heroes is a man named Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon was called the Prince of Preachers back in the 20th century. He had a church called the Metropolitan Tabernacle in England. And this pastor, Spurgeon, so incredible, so powerful in prayer and preaching, thousands of people were converted 
through his ministry. Really remarkable. He was well known now. He's well known in his time. And in the days of Spurgeon, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, a group of young ministers came to visit his church. Spurgeon, a good host, showed him around. It's like, hey, here, here's the atrium. I have no idea if they had an atrium. But imagine they had an atrium in the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Here's this, and then there's the congregation room. Here's we do our sermons. And then he's like, do you guys want to see the boiler room? No. <laughs> No one wants to see the boiler room. In the 1900s, it's all like steam operated. It's dark. It's dank. It's a gross place. Something's going to stick to you. It's probably a de- you know, skeleton in the corner. Those are not nice places to go to. But they, uh, he insisted, and he brought this group of young ministers down into the basement into the boiler room. The engine of the church, he would call it. And down there was a group of 100 people in earnest prayer for England and for their church. And he says, this is the boiler room. It's the engine of our church. It's the prayers of the saints. Guys, we are making a boiler room for Grace City Rome. And one day when, we ha- when we're older than like seven months old, I mean, we're still like infants, but one day... When we have our own spot, I'm going to make like a Spurgeon-esque boiler room. I don't know how we're going to do it, Pastor Chris, but that's what I want. I want a boiler room. I'm going to label it the boiler room. And we're going to pack you guys in there like sardines. It'll be a party. I'm coming too, and there will be no chance Rome, Georgia, and the places beyond it will be able to to contend against the power that's going to be unleashed in our boiler room. This world around us will have no hope when the power of God is unleashed in our neighborhood and those around us, right? Imagine what would happen if you became a mighty man or woman of prayer. How would you just picture how your life would be changed? Imagine that we as a church would become mighty in prayer. Jesus went into a temple and he saw a bunch of people extorting folks, money changers, and he came over and he ripped the tables and he drove everyone out. He was ticked. And folks remembered the scripture of like, ah, zeal for my house will consume me. He says, my house will will be called a house of prayer, a house of prayer. I I declare Grace City Rome a house of prayer. And it is not our cool, uh, pithy messaging or ministry or our neat tech or media. It's not the room or the facility. It's not our missional plans that make us successful. It's just the heart of God bursting forth through the prayers of his people. It's unlocking the power of Scripture and prayer on the world around us. 